This is The Secret Library, a podcast about writing and publishing books. I'm Caroline Donahue, a life coach who works with writers, and I'm here to tell you this is your year. It's time to stop waiting and start writing. Hi, everybody. As an exciting announcement this week, I wanted to let you know that I am reopening one-on-one coaching slots with me as of this week. You can check out the details of working with me at carolinedonahue.com slash coaching. I have a limited number of slots at the moment. I'm going to cap it at four people. One is already taken. So if you are interested, you'll want to go there as soon as you can. Again, it's carolinedonahue.com slash coaching to learn about signing up for a consult and working on me one-on-one to get your book down on paper. I hope to speak to you soon. This is episode 88. So we're doing something different this week on the podcast, which is I am taking some inspiration from my personal hero, Ira Glass, and doing an episode in three parts. I will not attempt to do Ira Glass's voice, but those of you who listen to This American Life will know what I'm talking about. So our first part is a conversation with me and my dear friend Dal Kular, who you will remember as a guest on the podcast before, talking about an issue that's really close to both of us, this idea of how we get stuck and give up on writing for ourselves. And it includes an offer or more an invitation, I would say, to all of you listening to participate with us in a project that we are starting out with. So we'll begin with Dal and me, and then we move on to an excerpt of a conversation I recently had on the podcast Ask Win um, with Win Charles, who is an author published numerous times who has cerebral palsy. And we're talking about how she creates her writing schedule and works on her writing schedule. And in the show notes, there will be links to her podcast where you can listen to our entire conversation. So that I found speaking with Wynne extremely inspiring on the theme that Dal and I will introduce in our portion of the conversation. And then finally, part three, another former guest, Mary Laura Philpott, the author of Penguins with People Problems. And I, every single time I talk to Mary Laura about what she's been reading lately and what she's excited about, I run to the bookstore and have new books within sometimes within hours of speaking to her. And this conversation was no exception. So we're going to go through what Mary Laura has been reading and what she's excited about for the first couple months of 2018. So those are our three parts. And now we will get started with Dal and me talking about the theme of I wrote it anyway. Okay, so welcome to part one of our exciting three part episode. Um, I have the wonderful Dal Kular with me. And we're going to talk about this project that we got really pumped about for 2018. Thanks for being here, Dal. Hi, Caroline. Thanks for having me. So we decided, well, how do we want to, how do we want to start? Do you want to, do you want to say a little bit about things we've been discussing lately? Because we've really been talking a lot about places where we get stuck and people are always talking about, even as recently as episodes where I'm interviewing published authors, they'll say things to me like, well, it was only at that point that I was allowed to call myself a writer and it was a restriction they placed on themselves. And so we started talking a lot about obstacles that people face that are unique to the idea of being a writer or writing or engaging in writing. And we really wanted to do something that would help support people in acknowledging this difficulty and in working through it. Yeah. Yeah. We've been talking a lot about that. I I think for various different reasons, you and I have both have been having to overcome our own obstacles and our own challenges and difficulties to get to the point where we feel comfortable um, in writing and keeping going with our writing. And I think it's just the recognition. um, I mean, personally for myself, it's the recognition that um, there's been a lot of structural obstacles in my way growing up to wanting to become a writer and um, and also just the rise of the working class writers movement on Twitter, which is um, Kit DeWall. She's written a book called My Name is Leon, who you're going to be having on your show, hopefully, um, has really raised this issue that um, 
there's a real challenge for writers from different different economic classes, um, cultural backgrounds, to actually get into writing and literature and, and becoming published. Um, there, there is this huge acknowledgement that's been happening over the last six months, couple of years, that we are only hearing a, a minority range of voices. And that's the voices that we are hearing tend to be people who've had access to really high quality education. For example, in England, the literary elite is dominated by people who've been to Oxford and Cambridge. And that's brilliant. You know, there's a huge amount of creativity that comes um, from those colleges. And is, and is shared with, with the world. But then we only hear limited voices. We don't hear what's happening with, say, disabled people or black people, or, you know, working class voices, people who live on the fringes or the edges, marginalised groups. Um, so for me, that's been a real theme that's been emerging over the, over the past year and something I've been reflecting on in terms of my own childhood experiences of being... Um, a working class Indian last in mid 80s in Sheffield and telling my careers officer I wanted to be a writer and being told that I couldn't and there was no suggestions for further education or potential career paths I just I left school with a couple of O levels and went straight well went straight on the dole actually so yeah there's been a lot of obstacles to overcome structurally culturally um politically societally but also we've been you and I've been talking about the obstacles that we have within us you know our personal obstacles lack of confidence not believing that we have any right to write that maybe our writing isn't any good or it's not worthwhile why write if I'm not going to be published nobody's ever going to publish my work absolutely so in response to that I think we've been talking about that side of it and also in the U.S having come off an election, which revealed these incredible schisms, I mean, between Brexit as well. So there's Brexit. We started talking about this when Dal and I had these like support conversations on the phone about, oh my God, after Brexit. And then I immediately called her after the election going, oh my God. She's like, oh, I've been through it. Here's how you're going to feel for the next few months. And talking about like an incredible schism between members of one's own country and feeling like we're not hearing everyone's voices. And part of the problem it felt to me really strongly is that why, who gets to tell the stories and how do they feel about telling stories and and why doesn't everyone feel permission to tell stories? And so in response to sort of working class writers movement and all of the, the ways that people are economically and culturally and socially shut out, There was also an experience where I sort of, I mean, I didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge, but I went to private school on the East Coast of the US and a a girl's school. And the message that I got was like, if you can't do it perfectly, don't do it at all. I mean, and to an extent where it's like, well, you know, women can do anything, but it was so, um, which was wonderful in a certain way. Like I, I went to a girl's school, I didn't have boys kind of dominating the conversation. And I remember clearly when we started to have classes with the boys in high school, my first thought was, oh, they're probably going to be kind of dumb. Like, so Mm -hmm. that part of the education really worked. But at the same time, there was a sense of like, why would you just be a writer? Like you should go and try to be a politician or a CEO or run a company or writing was seen as kind of like not that important. Or yes, of course, be able to communicate effectively, but in service of something, quote, more important. And to this day, like when I read my uh, my high school bulletin, I like want to crawl under the bed because everyone is so amazing. In, you know, they're like working for the UN and, and running, you know, cancer labs and, and they're amazing people. But I, I had that happen. And then I also had a personal experience in a creative writing class. I always took creative writing classes. My family was very supportive and still is of writing. Um, but something that no one can control was when we did have boys in the class, um, there was one who turned out to be a bit of a stalker. And I was in a writing class and he had written a story that was about him fantasizing about dismembering a woman. And there were a lot of details peppered throughout the story that referenced conversations he'd had with me. Mm -hmm. And it scared the shit out of me. And I associated writing with danger Mm -hmm. as a result of it. Mm -hmm. So this isn't something that happens to everybody, but in talking about how 
why don't people feel permission to write? It can be anything from something as horrible as being told by your careers officer that you don't get to write, like dull experience, to a totally fluke, weird personal experience, despite all of the educational sort of resources being provided. You just never know why someone feels like they can't write. And so we didn't want that to continue. So we started thinking about, well, how can we create something together that will help people face these difficulties and and maybe move past them? Because we both think that the way for a better society ahead is for people to hear real stories from real people about real experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we both of us have had to overcome um, our own obstacles, our own challenges and our own insecurities to get to this stage where we're at now. And that's been quite a journey. I mean, for both of us, probably several decades. Sorry, Caroline, I, I don't want to give away your age. <laughs> no, it's all right. Everybody knows. <laughs> but, you know, it's been, you know, a journey that's just taken so long to get where we're at now. So if there's anything that we can do, to help encourage, support, motivate other people who dream about writing, want to write or do write, but want to take the next step with the words or feeling, you know, where do they fit in into the world of writing? Um, We just really wanted to create a project that would support people to know that they're not alone and that there's other people that have walked difficult challenging paths before them for various reasons um so you know as you can hear caroline and i have both very different reasons that have affected our writing journeys i i think it's it's because i think the other thing is that i never want anyone to feel if they have an impulse to write this is kind of a grandiose goal but that it's not important that like oh it doesn't matter if i write this or not and I'm. this is just popping up in my head. Actually, we didn't even talk about this in conjunction with this project. But I remember hearing a study that they did when gay marriage was in the process of, of being voted into legalization. And there are, you know, large regions of our country that um, – both of our countries, I think. But in the, this study was done in the U.S. where – when you encountered an area where voters felt very strongly anti-gay marriage, they had experiences where they saw that someone like a gay person went in and had direct conversations with people who said, yes, I'm very opposed to it. And they met with a real like real life gay person who maybe they hadn't met before and had a whole conversation with them. And then as a result, they said, actually, I think gay marriage should be legal because I've spoken to Tom here and he's clearly a lovely person and he deserves to get married like anyone else. And I think that when we live in societies that are super striated and people don't hear stories from anyone whose experiences are different from theirs, then they just make up a story about what that's like. I mean, that's what happens when you don't have direct experience of something, your imagination fills in the gaps. And so anyone who thinks they have a story to tell, it's important because you're giving someone a real context for what your life is like. And there are so many people in so many circumstances and so many different issues throughout the entire world, not just the England and the uh, England and the U.S., that every story that's told fills in a little space where someone can have a real face behind a set of circumstances. And I can't think of anything more important right now yeah. than mm-hmm. those kinds of stories. All stories getting told. Yeah, absolutely, Caroline. Totally agree with what you've said. It's it's human. It's humanizing. You know, it's um, it's allowing people to be themselves and to be heard and to be part of society because there's many, many people who don't feel part of society, part of a community. Um, so yeah, it's 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 really, really, it's vital. I mean, just following on for that, I think just the personal experience of writing for somebody to write a story, it doesn't necessarily have to be their life story, but it could be a poem, it could be on anything, but that whole process of writing, it, it just lights something up inside yourself, inside the deepest part of yourself. And that can just be profoundly healing and transforming. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's those little steps we take to put our words out there. And when I say put our words out there, I'm not necessarily saying, you know, we need to put it on social media or um, out to the wider public, it could just be our notes in our journal. And I think people who journal write are amazing, um, incredible people, because they're daring, you know, to put down their deepest, darkest 
thoughts into on into writing into into a notebook but I, I also think that creates a little bit of space and light in our minds for other things to happen and to evolve but yeah writing is a revolutionary act it's it's a way to narrow the gap between different people to get more understanding between various Definitely. And that is a huge issue. I and mean, it's happened in England with Brexit and in America with the um, election of um, Mr. Trump. Yes. So with that in mind, we said, what can we do? And so what we've decided is we want to put together an anthology. We want to hear from you. We don't want this just to be us talking in isolation. Um, we want to make a larger conversation. So we are accepting submissions from the point that you hear this episode through March 15th, uh, 2018. And what we are looking for is essays from you of up to 2,500 words talking about ways in which you felt inhibited or encountered resistance in the face of wanting to write or become a writer. You don't have to be a published writer now. You don't have to consider yourself a writer now. So it's more like you said, I want to write and somebody said, mm, not practical or, or whatever it was that happened. It could, need, it could be something even like that wasn't involving anyone saying it. It could be just, I never had the time because I was, you know, all of these difficult circumstances in my life. But we want to know what your obstacle is that you've faced when you came towards the act of writing. Yeah. And it's up to two and a half thousand words. And if you want to include poetry or various kinds of prose, um, we haven't really got a format for spoken word, but you know, if you want to put something, if, it's, if you've got song lyrics or spoken words um, that we could like put into print. Um, so it could be fiction, it could be creative memoir, some life writing. Yeah, we're open to multiple formats. Yeah. And so what we're looking for is both, you know, stories of how you felt inhibited or, or felt resistance to becoming a writer, any messages you've received, what happened, because we want to acknowledge those. And then also what kind of inner support or outer support or what resources helped you feel like, I'm going to do this anyway. Yeah. You know, what What pushed you towards writing anyway? Yeah. And how have you been changed in the process? Yeah, I'm really interested. I'm really interested in the process of writing and how that um, is healing, how it helps. Sometimes it hinders. Um, how has it enhanced your life? How has it changed you? Because I think writing, if you write over a long period of time, it changes you. There's, I have absolutely no doubt about that. Um, so I'm I'm really interested. What does it mean to you to write? Absolutely. So we want to hear from you. And the way that you can submit these pieces is you can email them, I think as an attachment would be best. We can accept either Scrivener or Word Docs. Um, also Google Docs. That's fine too, as long as we can share them. But ideally, it would be a doc that we can open um, without too much difficulty to I wrote it anyway at gmail.com. So the title of the anthology is going to be I wrote it anyway. And we are going to compile um, probably about 20, 20 ish submissions. We're going to each write our own story as part of that. And uh, we're going to self publish it because we just want to get this out there as quickly as possible. And the other piece is that we are going to split the proceeds from this project and we're each going to donate it to a charity that supports writing and access. Um, so the charity in the U S is I'm going to donate it to 826 LA, which is Dave Eggers project, which helps young people, you know, supports them in pursuing writing goals. And it's started actually as 826 Valencia in San Francisco, and there is an 826 LA. So I'm picking a local LA charity. So Dal, do you want to say something about yours for the UK? Yeah. And um, I want to support Arts Emergency, 
um, which is a national charity um, that supports young people from low income backgrounds or marginalised groups to access um, education and opportunities in arts and humanities. And it recognises the real crisis that we have in this country um, of getting diverse voices into those areas of employment and opportunity. Um, so they mentor 16 to 18 year old, they match a mentor with a mentee, 16 to 18 year old young person and work with them for over a course of one year um, to try and help them achieve their goals and give them guidance and um, wisdom and inspiration. And I'll be mentoring my first um, person um, start next week. I meet them next week. So we're going to be working with them um, with mental health, creative writing and performance. Amazing. Mm, it is. It's a fantastic charity. And um, they've just over the last since they've been going the last few years, it's entirely funded by donations. Three of their um, people who've been through the mentoring scheme have actually got to Oxbridge. So not that it's all about going to Oxbridge, but that's the power that, you know, just evidence is the power of having mentoring, having opportunities, having access to somebody who really, really believes in you and says, you can do this. Because often it's that, you know, it's having somebody saying you can do this and somebody who's got your back that can get you to other places. Okay, not necessarily Oxbridge, but, it, you know, it get, might get you to university. It might get you published. It might put you in front of the right person. Sorry, I could go on about that for a long time, Caroline. <laughs> I know, we both could. And that's one final point that we want to encourage anyone to include, if they could, is what advice would you have for other people who encountered the same obstacles that you did to writing? If there was anything that helped, if there was anything that made it easier, anything that made you say, you know what, I'm going to write anyway, include that. Include what it was. Was it a teacher? Was it a friend? Was it something you read? Was it, you know, anything just like, fuck it, I'm going to do it anyway. You know, any sort of help that you received either internally or externally, share it because other people could be encouraged similarly. And we want to encourage as many people to write as possible because it is so very important. I think that would be a great mantra, Caroline. Fuck it. I wrote it anyway. Maybe we need to probably call it. <laughs> Maybe that will be the unofficial title of the thing because... I think we want to, um, everyone listening will know that that's really the title. We'll put some ellipses before the beginning <laughs> on the cover. I think it's really, you know, it's really, really valuable just to get those, you know, that, that wisdom from yourselves. Um, I, you know, we are future ancestors, you know, what are we, what do we want to say to people that are going to, you know, come after us? who might feel vulnerable or don't feel that they've got a voice or they want to write, but they don't believe in it, you know, we can really, really say something collectively special and powerful to those people. Absolutely. And we don't want them getting a view that is missing an enormous portion of the population because everyone deserves to be included. Yeah. Amazing. So send your submissions, please, to I wrote it anyway at gmail.com. We will have links and so on in the show notes as well. So if you're driving, please don't crash trying to write this down. Just go to the website and um, there will be show notes for you there. At secretlibrarypodcast.com, you can find us over there with the show notes. Hi there. So now we are moving out. I hope you're inspired and jotting notes down of, of what you could share with us in terms of your stories of what stopped you from writing and, and what inspired you to write it anyway. This is a topic that's really been with Dahl and me for a long time, as I'm sure you can tell from our conversation. And as a heroine and a great example of I Wrote It Anyway, I wanted to include a section of my conversation with Wynne Charles, an author, as I mentioned before, who has cerebral palsy. And she has published a memoir entitled I, Win. She is also working on fiction and a book about scoliosis, um, numerous books that she's worked on in the episode, she goes into some detail at the beginning about working with both dictation and then a ghostwriter and an editor in order to get her work out. But she has built a huge following, is a speaker, is also 
working on books all the time and is also pursuing a degree in journalism. So she's really inspiring and kind of the poster child of I wrote it anyway. She certainly doesn't let any of her challenges get in her way when she has goals about writing. So I wanted to include in particular this section in our conversation where she talks about her writing schedule and some things that she puts in place in order to get these writings, um, writing projects done. And again, check out the show notes at secretlibrarypodcast.com where there will be a link to the episode on her show, Ask Win, where you can listen to our entire conversation. So let's talk about your schedule a little bit. So you're in school and you are still teaching. You haven't walked away yet. And you're working on books. So what does your day look like in terms of your writing schedule? Well, in terms of my writing schedule, I... I put all the stuff I need to do on a physical schedule and email it to someone. So that person knows not to bother me. Otherwise, I would have people walking in. I would literally, because my office was at a baseball hallway. My bedroom door is open 24-7. I would literally have people walking in on me 24-7 if I allowed it. Yeah. yeah. So close the door. And step so one. I close the door. Step one, and just tell people what's going on. See, with doing a podcast or writing books, you need the support from your family. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so I, you have that support. Yeah. How much time do you spend writing every day? How much time are you able to spend? Well, right now, right now, as we. Um, do this interview, I'm sitting in front of my iPad, so I typically do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays except for this week. Although, I do have Google Docs on my phone, so if I, if I um, have time small, I will sit there and Wednesday morning I will sit and jot down a couple notes. So that's the cool thing about Google Docs is if I jot down notes on my iPhone, I can transfer them over to my iPad. Seamlessly, it talks to the iPad, and so does Microsoft Word. Great. Yeah, so you can make notes anywhere and then come back to them later yeah. so that you don't lose any yeah, ideas yeah, yeah, you yeah. have. Yeah, no. no that's really no. important. And so I'm writing Tuesdays um, and Thursdays. You're making notes on Wednesdays. That's my plan. And I'll definitely do um, do writing on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And now my fan base will hold me accountable. And yours will do a the secret library here because they will um, hold me accountable. But I'm pretty much on my iPad on my iPhone 24-7, so I pretty much have access to a notepad 24-7. And now we come to part three. My guest at this point in the episode is the amazing Mary Laura Philpot, author of Penguins with People Problems, who is currently at work on her second book. And she is also a an intricate part of Parnassus Books in Nashville, which many of you know is Ann Patchett's bookstore. And she is kind of a reading savant. I I have loved every single book she has suggested to me and devoured it, including television recommendations. We're thinking of starting a whole other show where we just talk about things that we love reading and watching. So I wanted to bring Mary Laura on. I think we're going to bring her on every few months to talk about the books that she's really excited about because... I think part of writing it anyway and being inspired is reading really great stuff. And we talk at one point in the episode about how she deals with writing her books when all she does all day for her job is to read and think about really great books that are at, you know, the highest point of their existence when she gets her hands on them. So I know you'll find that inspiring and it'll give you a really amazing reading list. Those of you who are driving while listening to this, do not panic. Every book with a link is going to be in the show notes. So please don't try to take notes while you're driving. Be safe and enjoy listening to Mary Laura. Hey, Mary Laura. Thanks for coming on to talk books. Thank you for having me. (laughs) 
I cannot resist. Anytime I'm like, ooh, I'm going to do this crazy multi-part episode, I got to get Mary Laura on to talk about the books. <laughs> I will talk <laughs> about books with you anytime. It's my favorite know, thing because, to do. I know. We might need like a breakout show. Like <laughs> Mary Laura and Caroline talk about The Crown, The Americans, and books. <laughs> and it's a podcast – that never ends. So people no, it, can just tune into it at any time and we'll still be talking. <laughs> you know, it's like a live stream. <laughs> Forever. Forever. <laughs> so I want to hear what you're excited about right now because literally okay. you have uh, no pressure, but you've never done me wrong. Everything that I have watched or read that you have suggested, I end up wow. like proselytizing about like a mad creature on Instagram. Like, look at this book. She told me to read it. Like exit West. I'm like, here it is. I'm so happy that you love that book. I'm so happy when anyone loves that book. It's It's beautiful. It's so great. He's, he's coming to Nashville this spring and I'm so excited. So fun. I know. I wrote to the publisher. I was like, Hey, I know he's like sequestered in writing, but when he comes out, (laughs) I really love to talk to him. Here's my number. Yeah, um, no. Well, good. I'm glad I I'm glad I don't do you wrong. I'll try to I'll try to keep up my streak. Yeah. So what do you what do you got for us for the first quarter 2018 reading must? Okay. Okay, we're gonna start with three January books that are all kind of about living and dying or not dying. So you've You've probably heard about The Immortalists by Chloe Oh, yeah. We had her on. She's amazing. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So, you know, I feel like everyone knows about this book. It came right out of the gate, hit the New York Times bestseller list. It was at the top of the Indie Next list, which is the – it's our list of most anticipated books recommended by indie bookstores. That's sort of our version of a – of a best of list. It's the Um, coolest. It's the coolest. And you know, it asks that question that everybody has pondered at some point, like late night at the bar over some beers. If you knew when you were going to die, how would you live your life? And would you even want to know? Would you want to know when you're going to die? So, you know, it starts in the sixties, four teenage siblings in the gold family meet a psychic who tells each of them separately the date of his or her death and then the novel follows them from there as they grow up and every sibling handles it differently um and it leaves such a nature or nurture question it does i thought reading it because i'm like does the knowledge then direct their lives i mean how could it not yeah it's such a good book club book there's so much discussion like there's so many jumping off points for just deep philosophical chat. Yeah. Um, okay. But and it's you, such a beautiful, it's beautiful writing. Oh, Loved gorgeous. It. And, and also a beautiful cover. Gorgeous good cover. One, good one to face good out to on your bookshelf. It'll yeah. make you look cool. <laughs> okay. So if you love that one, there are two more that I absolutely loved that I think group really well together. And if you want to, nice. like if you have one of those really go-getter book clubs where people read more than one book <laughs> every time. The which, follow up. You know, yeah, some people do. These would be a great, this would be a great sort of set of book triplets to read together. Um, the Afterlives by Thomas mm. Pierce. Do you know this one? No. Okay, so here's a fun fact about this. My husband and I never liked the same books. We just, he, we just read vastly different stuff. We both loved this book. Whoa. I stayed up until one o'clock in the morning to finish it because I needed to know how it ended. And then I woke him up and said, you need to read this book next. And I don't think he appreciated the 1 a.m. wake up, (laughs) but he really, really did love the book. So it's in this book, you've got a 30-year-old guy named Jim Bird, and he briefly dies. He has a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it's one of those things where he's dead for a few minutes, but then he's revived short. So that's kind of your first moment in the book where you've got this crossing over from life into death. Shortly thereafter, he's in a bar. He meets a girl named a woman named Annie, who he had known back in high school and they fall in love and she's the love of his life. And so it's now you're onto a love story. So kind of for a minute, it's life and death. Then it's a love story. Then he and Annie meet a ghost. Ooh. I know. And this, I sort of struggle always with how much of this story to tell people before they read it. And I'm leaning towards saying less about what happens, but he and Annie start researching um, who is this ghost and uh. where did it come from? And so the book starts jumping back in time 
a little bit to where the ghost came from and who the ghost is. And it's so, it's such an original book. It reminded me just the tiniest, tiniest bit of The Time Traveler's Wife by mm. Audrey Niffenager. Um, I wouldn't say, I like, I wouldn't compare them and say it's just like that, but it has that little element of going back and forth through time and communicating with somebody in a different time. And it makes you think about all kinds of deep stuff. Like what happens to our souls when our bodies are gone? Mm. Um, it's got humor in it. It's, I just, I adored it. And there's a mystery to it as well, because they're unraveling. I love it. Yeah, they're unraveling who this ghost is and why this ghost keeps coming back. And as they do, they get access to, um, I don't want to say too much. They get access to something that can tell them about their own. Ah. Character, if that makes any sense. I'm being, I'm being purposefully vague. No, I love that. It's. It I'm was, in. It's one of my very, very favorite books of this month. And I've been so excited for it to come out so that I can get other people to read it and then we can talk about it. Okay, um, awesome. And on that same similar theme, but weirder, and I say weirder in the in the most loving way. I use weird as a, as a compliment. Eternal Life by Dara mm. Horn. This, uh, this is a Norton book. And it is... It's so strange. So this is actually the book of the week in my <laughs> tiny letter this week. And I was like, wait, don't go away. This is going to seem weird, but you got to promise me you'll read it. If somebody had told me what this book was about before I read it, I might have passed on it, which would have been a shame. But I, it was in my pile to read, so I just picked it up and, and started in on it. Um, so on the surface, this is the plot. 2,000 years ago, and that's where I say, wait, come back. <laughs> 2,000 years ago <laughs> in Jerusalem, a woman named, a young woman named Rachel makes a deal to save her young son's life. And it is a spiritual deal in which the price she pays is to be cursed with immortality. Ooh. So she can't die. Right. Ever. So she keeps rebooting her life as like, she'll get to the end of her life as an old woman. And instead of dying, she starts over again as a young woman. So she lives through adulthood again and again, oh, and again boy. for centuries. And she keeps running into every few decades or so, she runs into the one other person who suffered the same curse. Um, and it's her on again, off again, beloved. Of course. So it's like, it's like if you combined Groundhog Day <laughs> with, <laughs> remember the Kate Atkinson novel, Life After Life? Life After Life, Which is yep. my favorite book of 2013. It's like those two mushed together with just its own unique thing. And it's, I know it sounds strange. And I know the 2000 no, years it sounds ago good. Thing can be maybe off-putting, but it is amazingly relatable. And one of the most contemporary current themes in it, I think, is parenthood. So because Rachel lives mm. adulthood again and again and again, um, she keeps having new marriages and children and she oh, keeps, God. yeah. So she keeps having different children with different men. And because she's never actually dead, she's walking around on earth decade after decade for centuries. And she lives through the deaths of hundreds of her children. So she sees oh. all her children live out their lifespans, which means this book gets to get into some really deep, true emotions about love and religion and parenthood and family. And it's also got some unexpected humor. Like mm. the first time she encounters her, this beloved who keeps popping up through time, she's like, Oh God, not you again. And so it has this whole, like the bad boyfriend, <laughs> but who you keep ending up with kind of thing to it. Yeah. It's just, it's lovely. It's, it's an unusual book. And if you're willing to go a little strange, I just absolutely love it. Want, I'm always willing to go a little strange. I want everyone to read it. It's and it's really it's truly one of the most emotionally true books about parenthood I have ever read. I feel like this theme of of like life and death or immortality or any of that it's like the Benjamin Button thing like not being able to die. There's another one coming out and this is I'm going to be that jerk who comes in the bookstore and is like it's got a blue cover. How to stop It's from Penguin. Time. Yeah, how to stop yes. time. 
Yes, this is. A I just got right that now. one in the mail, yep. and I haven't read it yet. But I was like, "Ooh, I haven't read that." Similar one yet, though, either, like, yeah. don't you dare fall in love because you're not allowed to because yep. there's a secret society of people who live forever, and it's a bad <laughs> idea. <laughs> Actually, um, Ron Charles at the Washington Post did a great article the other day on the three books that I just talked about and that one, yeah. and how that theme is so out there for some reason right now. It's kind of funny how. That sort of synchronicity of books that are being written at different times by different people will bubble up at the same time and and have a, a similar theme. Yeah, it makes me kind of want to dial back in time because, of course, you every book that comes out, you're like, oh, it's so timely right now. It's like, well, they didn't write it last week. Right. You know, they wrote it like <laughs> anywhere from two to like eight years ago, right. you know, in terms and they started thinking about it like as long as, you know, 10, 20, yep. whatever years ago. Yep. Makes you wonder so what it's was like bubbling up. Going on. Yeah. What was happening? I want to talk about some short stories too. Mm. But before I do, I want to really fast mention two other novels. Okay, yeah, one bring is it. called Brass by Jeanette Alieu. Mm. And this is actually the first editions club pick of my bookstore, Parnassus Books. Not my bookstore. I don't own it. I just work there. But we send out a signed <laughs> first edition of a book every month to our little subscriber list. And this is the book we picked. And it's it's, I wish I had the cover so I could show it to you while we're chatting. Um, it's parallel narratives. It jumps back and forth through time. So it, there's one narrative about a couple um, who meet and get accidentally pregnant. And then there's another narrative that's 17 years later. And as you can guess, it is the child of that relationship, right. a daughter and her mother. Um, and the voices in this novel are really really fantastic. That's what makes it. Um, and then the other one I want to mention before we have to short stories is Neon in Daylight by Hermione mm. Hobie. And this one just came oh out God. in January. And one of my bookstore colleagues just wrote on our blog about how much she adored it. It's a great one if you've ever lived in New York, especially if you lived there as a young, broke, 20-something woman. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I I did that. Did I, I that? did that right up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It captures that time of life. It captures that city. She's a really efficient writer. Um, some of my favorite parts of the book were at the very beginning, just getting used to the way she writes sentences. They're just beautiful. It'd be a fun book to nice. teach, I think. Okay. So that's totally, in. those are novels. Okay. Now I'm so excited. Where's my copy of this book? Oh, well, it's called, it's, there it is. It's behind me. It's called Back Talk. Yes. By, she was on too. No way. Okay. See, I need to go back through your archive. Because I'm behind on my on my. Camera. She hasn't. That one hasn't come out yet because it's coming out when that book comes out. Okay, perfect. All right, so it's that's like next week, I think, or the week after. Yeah, it's 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 in a couple weeks. Okay, well, I love it. Back talk by Daniel so good. Lazarin. It's so good. Everyone is talking about it. I feel like it's got the best blurbs from all the writers that we. Oh love. my god! Total blurb. You know, Celeste Ng, Ruman Alam, all our favorite people. Um, I know. And my yeah, I was talking to um, Eden Lepucky about it. Yeah. And she's like, I think I blurbed that book. And I'm like, you did, girl? <laughs> she did. Or no, no, no. She blurbed. Did she blurb that one or The Immortalists? I can't remember. But she blurbed one of them. It's all our favorite people. It's all, it's all good They're stuff. They're all supporting each other, which is wonderful. Um, and my copy of this, which was an early copy, came with a letter from Danielle in the cover. Yes. And I don't know – like in the, in the real thing that when it actually comes out, if people will get that. But it's what I loved about that letter that she wrote is, is how she talks about the way big, splashy, dramatic stories get a lot of attention. But what really yes. needs telling are those smaller, quieter, you might call them more domestic stories about everyday women's lives. And I just so agree with that. <laughs> Like I yelled amen when I read that letter. I was like, that is, I mean, I, like, don't get me wrong. I love to read about the crazy dramatic stuff. Like I will read about the captain of a ship that goes down in the ocean. That sounds great. But I, but I love to read about real moments in real women's lives. And there's a line in this letter where she says she's drawn to the stories about the often unspoken ways women care for each other and ourselves. Mm. And that is what this book is about. It's just, I love it. One of the, my favorite story is near the beginning and it's the one called Floor Plans. 
Remember that mm. one? It's, About the apartment. Yes. So it's you've got these these two women who live across the hall from each other, and one, our narrator, is going through a divorce, and then the one across the hall is pregnant, and the pregnant one sets her sights on the apartment of the one who's divorcing. She wants to get it when they move out. Um, and then I, you know, I won't mention more than that, but what I loved about this story was that it represents such a delicate bubble of a moment in these women's lives. You know, it's just, it's a temporary friendship and it's a temporary moment that both of them are in and the story just lights it up. Yeah. And I think the other thing that I loved about that story and really all of them is that as you're reading it, it kind of forces you to confront your expectations about how the story is going to go. Because it sets up a scenario like the one you just described, and then you are kind of waiting for them to get in a cat fight. Like you can see yourself (laughs) trying to prescribe like the way that narrative usually functions, and she refuses to go along with it. Yes, exactly. It's, it's, It's the more real version of women's stories told beautifully. Exactly. I mean, she. We had an interesting conversation, which people will hear on the episode about um, the way that people have responded to it, mm-hmm. which is like feminist, a tra- like amazing, <laughs> like it's trans. And she's just like, I was just trying to talk about how people actually yeah, are, just real people, and. And I was like, I thought to me it felt real and and there is something feminist about that, but it doesn't feel – for anyone who's reading all this press and is like, oh, like it, it sounds really like – Political. Yeah. Preachy or intense no. and it's not. It's absolutely not. I think critics just got – had the reaction I had of reading it like, oh, I am expecting this and I get something else, which is actually how people right, actually right. are. Which in some ways that sort of is an act of resistance to tell real stories about real women's lives that aren't – those Hollywood tropes, the cat fights and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. So yeah. Totally. I love it. Um, I yeah. don't know when I'll talk to you next, but just while we're talking about short stories, I do have to mention that everyone should pre-order Curtis Sittenfeld's upcoming book. Oh God, yeah. I love her. I, I love her. Her writing is fantastic. The collection is called You Think It, I'll Say It. It comes out in April, Ooh. so we can talk about it in more depth later. Um, but the fun fact yeah. is, <clears throat> excuse me, Reese, Rithers- Reese Witherspoon is going to be developing it into a show. And guess who's going to be in it? <gasps> Kristen oh. Wiig. Kristen Wiig. Oh, Amazing. No. I'm so excited. So we'll talk more about that one later, but put that on your pre-order list. Go ahead and read it. See if you can get her on the show. All right. We'll get, get all of them on the show. Here. All of them. Um, okay. So we've talked about novels. We've talked about short stories. Let's talk about essays. Yeah. Give me the essays. Okay. All right. Again, while everyone who's listening to this is just hearing audio, but I'm looking at you and I want to hold up the covers. (laughs) I don't have this one in the room. Oh, wait, I do. It's back there right by Back Talk. It's called I Am, I Am, I Am. Nice. By Maggie O'Farrell. The title is a reference to a Sylvia Plath poem. It is, so you know, there's kind of two types of essay books. Well, there's many types of essay books, but I've kind of grouped them into two. There are essays where each essay is taking on a topic and the and the collection is sort of a cultural commentary of some sort along a theme. And then there are personal essay collections right. where it's kind of a memoir in essays. It's like the inward focus versus the outward focus essay. Right. Right. So this is the memoir in essays kind of book that is personal essays about her, but she writes she writes them in such a way that they do all the themes feel universal and you're reading about her, but you kind of feel like you're reading about you at the same time. And it's the best example of that type of book I have read in so long. Mm. So the subtitle of the collection, it's called I Am, I Am, I Am. And the subtitle is 17 Brushes with Death, Ooh. which is such a good subtitle. And I know it sounds kind of far-fetched, like, okay, who has really had 17 Brushes with Death? But what she argues in this book is that we're all having near-death experiences all the time. Mm. We are all, everybody's just dancing on the line between life and death at any minute. And we're kind of, I just realized we're kind of getting back to that theme we had at the beginning I of the know. show. I know. I was like, full um, circle. 
life and death, we're right there. So she kind of loosely uses that as a through line, not in a gimmicky way. Like It's not like number 14 time I almost died, but it's a way that shows how many times in her life and in all our lives, we have these small moments that change everything or that could have changed everything if one little thing had gone differently. That's the structure. That's what gives it structure, but it's the story of, of her life. The opening chapter, if you read the opening chapter, you cannot put the book down until you finish it. It's about, <laughs> it's about a time when she was a young woman and she went out for a hike by herself and she was attacked by a strange man. Oh, God. Yeah, exactly. And she achieves the most incredible tension in this essay. Like just talking about it right now, I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> You can't breathe the whole time you're reading this essay. It's amazing. Nice. So this book is so good. It, it actually, it kind of rocked my world a little bit. I had to stop writing for a week or so after I finished it because I couldn't help thinking nothing will ever be as good as this. Oh God. Like, no one should even try. I give it to, I'm not going to write essays anymore. This book is, this book is just too perfect. It's the, it's the ultimate example. Um, Can we talk about that for one minute? Because yeah. This episode began with my conversation with Dahl about, I wrote it anyway. And as a person who regularly encounters like polished, finished manuscripts that have been through the whole process, and as an insider, you know the whole process, but oh, yes. you're actively working on a book right now yes. and reading all of this and reviewing yes. it. Like, How does that impact your writing process? If we can take yeah. two minutes on that, because I think... We need to. <laughs> That's a, it's a good topic. So I've, I ask when I interview authors, I like to ask this question, which is, can you read in your genre while you're writing? Yeah. So like if you write thrillers, can you read thrillers for fun while you're writing? Or do you need to step out of that space of reading other people's thrillers? while you're writing your thrillers. Um, and everyone has different answers. Some people are, are like, you know, when I write memoir, I can't read anyone else's memoir because I, I start to compare too much or I'm afraid I'll slip into that person's voice because their voice gets into my head. Other people say, oh, of course I can. In fact, you should because you should be reading to, to see how people do it right. And I kind of, I tend to fall sort of in the middle. So I've, I love to read personal essays. I love to read memoirs and I will read them what I can't do is sit down and read a memoir, put it down, and then sit down at my computer. That's too close. Right. So I try to put some space in between the writing and the reading and be careful about it. Um, I learned so much from other writers, and I feel like I can I sort of blend enjoying it as a enjoying those books as a reader with studying them as a writer to go, okay, how did you structure time in your book? How did you break things into chapters? But I don't often have the experience I had with I am, I am, I am, which is that I put it down and went, I'm throwing my whole book away. I give up. This is, it's too perfect. <laughs> Nothing will ever be as perfect as this book. But, you know, I was wrong. People should keep writing personal essays and collections because there's another one I want to tell you about. <laughs> and I'm glad he's doing it too. So this one comes out in April. So we'll talk more about it later. Just put yeah. it on your pre-order list. Alexander Chi. It is, it's called How to Write an Autobiographical Novel. Uh -huh. It should be called How to Write a Personal Essay Collection because it's a great, like you could study this to see how it should be done. Nice. Um, it's about, it's called How to Write an Autobiographical Novel because it's very much about his evolution as a novelist and how he became a writer. Um, there's a section about how he got his MFA at Iowa. There's a lot about how he built his career. Mm. But some of the best writing in this book and what I think I love most was his coming of age as a young gay man, man in the 1980s and the AIDS crisis is in the backdrop. Um, there's some of the most beautiful writing in this book about friendship. It's just a really, really well done, one of those books that you can read for pleasure, but you can also read to study how to write a book like this. Although I got to the end of I am, I am, I am, and thought no one should ever try to write personal essays again, <laughs> including me. I am glad that people still are. And Alex Chi is doing it and he's doing a great job and I'm going to keep trying. So there you go. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. That one's coming out in April. Two more to mention just real quick, kind of on that note, nonfiction. There's a book called Text Me When You Get Home. Mm. 
And the subtitle, it, it's, I love the title, but the subtitle is The Evolution and Triumph of Modern Female Friendship. Mm. So kind of back to what we were talking about with Back Talk yep. and Danielle Lazar. And this is by Kayleen Schaefer. And it's about female friendship, which love is, it. you know, female friendship is kind of changing the world these days. It is. You know, so that's a good one. And then This Will Be My Undoing by Morgan Jerkins. Morgan, mm. she's an editor at Catapult, the website, but the book is actually coming out from Harper Perennial. She's a genius and it's cultural commentary, but it's also personal writing and it needs to be on everybody's must read list. So, I love it. Yeah. Those are kind of my favorites right now. What are your favorites well, right now? I, I, that makes me want to get into like a, a cottage with books. <laughs> And talk to no one until I've read all of them. I know. I'm having this moment of paralysis right now. I just came home from a, a book conference and my to read pile, my mail pile at the bookstore was already teetering dangerously high. And then I came home with a suitcase full of more books and I, I don't know where to start. Yeah. I'm so excited about so many of them. 2018, I tell you, 2017 was a good year for books. I had a handful of of favorites that I really, really loved, but it wasn't my best year of book favorites. 2018 already, there are so many books I'm excited about. The spring, oh my gosh. There are so many good books coming out in late April, May, June. So many. Yeah. It's great. So I'm I'm paralyzed right now because I don't know what to read next. No, I know. Well, it's like too much. I hesitate to even tell you. I mean, some of them, I mean, I love The Immortalists, so you don't have to worry about that. And love Daniel Lazarin. I also read um, Jasmine Darznick's Song of a Captive Bird, which is coming out. Oh, I haven't read that yet. What did you think? It's good. It's good. She's coming on, but it's it's about um, Iran's kind of most famous rebel woman poet. And she lived a very short life, like 32 but it sort of goes through her whole life and it's it's inside of this Middle Eastern story of, you know, Iran and rebellion and writing poetry and talk about I wrote it anyway. Yeah. She's all about I wrote it anyway. So that was really great and I think pretty inspiring for for anyone looking to kind of overcome an obstacle. Oh good. So I can put that out there, but yeah. um I think I think those are those are my big ones. I mean, I'm trying to think of my whole list. And whenever anyone asks me that question, and I don't have it on paper in front of me. I'm like, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> also, it's a little bit like, pick your favorite child. Here you go. And I'm like, oh, I can't. I know. People walk into the bookstore and, and go, well, what have you read and loved lately? And I just gesture to the whole front table, <laughs> like all of this, <laughs> all of this is here for you to enjoy. Yeah, and it's so- also like, everybody is so different. It's like, what do you like? But um yeah. That's what you think- gotta you gotta say, okay, what's the last book you loved? And if they yeah. can name the last book they loved, then I can I can usually help them find the next book they will love. Right. I know. It's like if you like this, you'll like this. Mm-hmm. But um I think this gives everybody a lot to go on, which is yeah. awesome. Good. And um I have we're gonna have epic show notes with links. So Yes, I'll send don't you panic. Them. Don't drive off the road if you're listening on the road. They are in the show notes. <laughs> Absolutely. At secretlibrarypodcast.com. You can go and look them up. And um, thank you so much for for sharing your your reviews and your thoughts once again. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me do this. Yeah. Well, well let's do it again soon. Let's awesome. do it again in a couple months. I love it. We'll do it. Yay. Thank you for listening to the Secret Library Podcast. The show is produced by me, Caroline Donahue, and Frederick Barry McWilliams Jr., my tireless audio engineer. To get show notes for this episode and all other episodes, please visit secretlibrarypodcast.com. To get updates, literary love, and notification when new episodes are posted, sign up there for Footnotes, my newsletter. And to learn about life coaching with me to work on building your writing life, visit carolinedonahue.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. Gold stars to everybody who leaves a rating and review on iTunes. We're so grateful. Until next time, happy reading.